we understand to a certain level the systems we are creating, but we also understand our role that we have in society. We make sure that we can collaborate, we find the right language, we find the right discussions and the humbleness to make sure that those that we need to help us creating systems that are going to be accepted and are going to have a place in our society are going to be integrated. Welcome to How AI Happens, a podcast where experts explain their work at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. You'll hear from AI researchers, data scientists, and machine learning engineers as they get technical about the most exciting developments in their field and the challenges they're facing along the way. I'm your host, Rob Stevenson, and we're about to learn how AI happens. Here with me today on How AI Happens is the adjunct professor for sustainable, ethical, and trustworthy AI over at Vleric Business School. She's also a multiple repeat author on all topics AI and machine learning. Mika de Quetzalada. Mika, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So pleased to have you. A million directions we can go here in this conversation. I guess before we do any of that, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and your journey in the space to set a little context for the folks at home? Sure. Well, I'm an engineer by education, studied robotics, AI, and I'm really referring to the deep learning part of AI. Back in 92, say something about my age, also about the fact that AI isn't new at all. However, at that time, it wasn't a very hot topic, a little investment. So I jumped to the other side of technology, which was the internet, you know, startups that were forming around digitalization. Spent 27 years in that area, working for big corporates before jumping back to my original dream of you know, making sure that we create systems that can do things by themselves, namely AI. And so that's what I've been doing then in the last five years, being heads on 100% in AI space again. What made you decide it was time to get back to your dream, as you put it? Well, what I noticed is that, yeah, AI became a hype. You know, people started to talk about it in the media. Companies were starting to create events with AI in the title. And initially, I just thought, well, let's have a look at what has changed since my studies until I realized not that much had changed. Yeah, the compute power had changed and the volumes of data had changed, but in the principles hadn't changed that much. Only some really important points never made the translation. You know, really important points about the fact that a model that comes with a certain accuracy that isn't a rule-based system that always works exactly the same is simple things like Actually, they weren't translated correctly. So people started to talk about it in a way which wasn't really the way it is working. And so I thought, this is dangerous. This is really dangerous. And that's where I started to say, well, engineers need to make a little effort and to explain how it exactly works, what it can do and what it can't do. So I guess maybe open-ended question, but what can it do? What can it do? Where are we with it right now? (laughs) <laughs> okay, but that that's always interesting uh, if when we talk about AI. Maybe then we first also have to say which definition we're going to use today with AI. Huh? Unfortunately, we're still in the area where there's many definitions floating around. So if we take AI as a system that has the ability to learn by itself by looking at a huge volume of data and seeing some correlations in that data, seeing some patterns in that data, then we can say that these systems, they do fantastic things. They do things better than a human brain can do. But they always have a certain error margin. They come with a certain accuracy, 97% accurate, 93%, 87% accurate, etc. So the fact is that although they give a lot of advantages because they don't need a lot of human thought in creating rules and rules and rules and rules and, and program code, we do know that their answer might come with a certain error. So this is one of the things that never made translation. Second thing that, for example, never made translation is the fact that these systems work in a certain context on which they have been trained based on the data they've received, received data from a certain context. So if they're trained in that data, they will behave correctly in that same context. But if you change the context or if the context changes by itself, for example, or world has moved on in the last years to COVID, well, these systems are going to start to misbehave they don't automatically adapt themselves. You need to have your processes in place in order to make sure that these systems adapt to the change in context. So simple things like these that we see in the data science course, very first chapters, they have never made it to translation. And that's where it gets a little bit dangerous. Why does it get dangerous? It gets dangerous because as people do, people tend to focus on the profits side of things. 
And it's always normal in technology. We always first look at the profit side. That was the case when we were starting to drive the car. We first use the car before looking into the fact that maybe we need to have some security measures to protect ourselves and to protect uh, accidents from happening. So um, as business always looks at profit first, which is normal because business needs to make profit, AI systems were starting to be included into operational processes in companies, but just and only from the profit side, not understanding that, for example, they might have a negative impact on people, especially when they start to make automated decisions out of it. The common mistakes happening in bias only appeared and became visible after a couple of years. Second fact is that technology, although it does very good things and might bring you the profit, it comes also to a certain cost, an energy cost. If I refer again to it like with the car, initially our car was doing fantastic things, but the consumption of our motor wasn't very much in balance with sustainability goals. We worked on the motor. Well, the same thing with AI. AI does fantastic things, brings a lot of profit but also comes at a certain energy cost. So we need to work on the motor of AI, we need to work on energy efficient hardware, energy efficient algorithms, etc. So these were the things that we didn't put correctly because we were in this hunt for profit from a technology point of view. The car comparison, I think, is very apt because the seatbelt was a late invention, right? I think vehicles had permeated the market at 60, 70 years later, we decided to invent the seatbelt. And even earlier than that, I'm sure traffic signs and and speed limits came only after lots of people were hurt driving cars. So Correct. really accurate, I think, comparison. Also, with AI, not quite as simple in practicality as inventing the seatbelt, right? How do you approach that question of building responsible AI? Well, building responsible AI, first of all, is moving it away from a pure engineering point of view. Engineers, what do they love to do, and I'm just counting myself into this because I'm an engineer, is we love to solve problems with technology, but we don't always think the whole thing through at design phase. So we don't always look at the fact that it might have a negative impact on a certain, for example, group or a certain area, etc. So what we need to do is we need to understand our limitations, how good we are as an engineer in solving technology problems. We are limited in understanding the impact they might have on society, on ethical implications, etc. So it is just a matter of a fact that at design phase, so before we put and switch on our systems, is we have a little collaboration and we sit together in a multidisciplinary debate with psychologists on the table, sociologists on the table, etc. From one side, but also with people from the legal side. So at the moment, what you see is when AI starts to misbehave, it's at that point in time, when damage is done, we're going to start to look at the legal side of it. And that's too late. So we should move everything like this, like cybersecurity part, the ethical part, the user experience part even, put this right at the design phase. Sit around the table with the engineer, but with all the other disciplines that can have an impact by the decisions and discuss the things through before deciding to switch on the systems. So... Let's move out of our silos and sit together in a multidisciplinary debate to discuss the systems we're going to create. As you mentioned, the legislative piece of this will always act too slowly, right? I think we've even seen that in the last Mm -hmm. 15, 20 years with the permeation of so much technology. Is that the only way to really hold people accountable? Like, Can we just expect people to build technology responsibly because they ought to? I fear that the incentives are misaligned. No, no, no. And I absolutely agree with you. First of all, It's a complex technology. It's a lot of times algorithms are hidden within an application. So they aren't visible. They aren't as visible as a car is. A car accident is very visible. It's very understandable. Algorithms aren't. You know, I think that's one challenge. Second thing is that it's also technology that evolves very fast. In fact, it's a scientific discipline of only 70 years old, but a discipline that moves very, very fast, even for somebody in there 100% of their times. At the moment, it's difficult to keep up the pace of of the evolution and the innovations that are done in that area. So is legislation the only way to do it? No, not at all. I think it is, um, first of all, a very responsible part in it for the engineer to translate to the back end what we're doing, what they're doing, why we're doing certain things. Second thing is there's also a need from everybody around us who is wanting to use this technology to get to a certain level understanding of how it works. And let me just compare it to the microwave. If we are in our homes, we're looking in our homes, most people have a microwave. Do they exactly understand the physics? No, they don't. 
but they know it, how to use it correctly, what materials to use in it, etc. To a certain level, we need to make sure that people that want to use smart watches and smart assistants and autonomous vehicles, that they understand also how they work to a certain level. So they can take their own responsibility and understand the limitations of this technology. And the third in line is indeed that for those people, and there will always be people using it incorrectly, for those people that we have some frameworks in which we can work correctly. And these are the ones that are still missing. So how would you outline that sort of framework? Well, the framework is, is a very challenging one, and it's also the one that Europe is struggling with. But on the other side, I'm very proud of being European because at least we look into this. So the point is that AI covers all different types of sectors. It's not like medicine, which just covers the human body and everything around it. AI covers health sector, space tech, biotech, clean tech, etc. So that's already a challenge by itself. And then additionally, it covers also a lot of different types of technologies, from knowledge graphs to deep learning technology to genetic algorithms, etc. So you have a matrix of complexity on complexity. So... How would you do this framework is making sure that those who create a framework, they do this in a, in a step way approach and maybe have different versions of it for different sectors or different versions for different types of technologies. Putting it all like we've done at, your, at the moment in European AI Act into one framework is, in, in my opinion, it's my personal opinion, the best way to go because of the complexity of the matrix in which we're working. So um, the European AI Act is just one act covering all sectors and covering all type of technologies covered by the definition of AI. And that's a very difficult one to do. Is the definition of AI they're operating on the one that you outlined at the beginning of this episode, or how are they framing the question? Well, I would really advise everybody to read the first pages of the European AI Act. You see that they're also struggling with the definition of what AI is. Should it just cover machine learning and deep learning? But then it seems to cover only the current Parts of you know learning algorithms being supervised learning mainly, but then what about the new learning algorithms right? where we're going to use transfer learning? They aren't involved in the, in the act. So as mentioned, you can't blame it on your. I think they do a fantastic thing to make first steps, but the technology is evolving so fast that it's a very difficult one to put it into one act that's going to be accurate at each point in time. So by the time they get the feedback from all the regions on what should be changed in the text, we are four years ahead. And at that point in time, AI has completely changed already. I mean, transformer models, uh, everybody talks about right now, they weren't covered by the AI Act because they weren't even existing two, three years ago. And that's a difficult challenge. You know, that's not like in medicine where you get 3,000, 4,000 years to work out the context we're going to work in and in, in which practitioners or health practitioners can work. They had so many years to work on this. We've only had 70 years in an area which changes year after year after year. So it's a challenge. It's a very big challenge. So in my opinion, the responsibility and the accountability remains a lot with the engineers, but also with business wanting to get a profit out of it. You know, the point I was making before is that I'm okay that you can make profit out of it, but then you need to know for yourself to a certain level, and you need to take the accountability yourself as a company to understand the limitations and in which context you can work with it. Yeah, the shifting nature of this tech, making it slippery to legislate, does that mean we need to just continually reintroduce new legislation or is it a language issue? Can we put up a big enough umbrella that we can write laws for things that don't yet exist? Well, that's the challenge indeed that there is. Huh? And also the key role in my book is for something I call the AI translator. Because what you have here is on one side, you have the engineers moving on very fast with a language that is not understood by other people. I know algorithms, alpha, betas, gammas, etc. That's not the standard language we're speaking in. So you need to have like a middle role of a person who can translate the work that's done by an engineer to other areas, to the other domains I was mentioning, and that can you know make sure that people start to collaborate and discuss things properly together. And this is what is really missing at the moment is that people writing books about AI ethics, when you read through this, you go like, well, this is not how it works. And so I would almost... I'm going to say it incorrectly, but I would almost urge the fact that we stop a little bit with research on AI and we first are going to figure out together, all together, where we are at and which direction we should take. But what you see is that the digital gap on AI between those creating the systems and those understanding the system is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I literally will take now six weeks holiday myself to study 
I would love to be outside in the, in the pool and, you know, enjoy the beach. But I see that if I don't take this time now to study on the latest models and the latest algorithms and everything that's happening is that I will be out myself when I get back in September. And this is not okay. You know, this speed we're taking right now on AI, it should be calmed down because I think otherwise we'll be also creating conflicting systems, people not understanding each other anymore. When you read some of the dialogue happening around AI ethics, and like you mentioned, you read some of these books and you think that they're just a little divorced from reality or perhaps the practicality of how these tools are developed. What do you think the dialogue is kind of missing when you say that they're a little removed from reality? Well, they're missing the real understanding of how the systems work. And you see a lot of focus on bias at the moment. To be very honest, bias in AI has been tackled through research and there's a lot of insights and approaches already, methodologies on how to make sure that you can remove as much as possible bias from your systems, because you can't make your systems bias-free, but you can do actions or you can take the right actions. But for me, there's many other issues next to bias. It's also the use of deep fakes in areas where we didn't expect it. Huh? We talk about deep fakes in news, we talk about deep fakes in videos. But to be honest, in Europe, at least, deep fakes appear, for example, in car insurance companies. Deep fakes appear in medical contexts. We see now recently, we saw a case of deep fakes being used, incorrectly used in e-commerce. These points haven't been tackled by AI ethics, but that's also ethics. It's business ethics. And whereas bias is towards a human person, this is towards uh, business. And so what you see is there that people writing the ethical guidelines is that they are unaware of this because it's not visible. Also here for me, the AI translator has enormous work to do in order to make sure that people understand what can happen if you share your systems in a free open environment, you know, and that's because that's what's happening. And that's why China, for example, or even Google is now putting their deepfakes behind APIs uh, because they understand very much the limitations. But this is only just starting right now. When you say AI translator, do you mean an AI apologist or some kind of a marketing role? What is the role of the AI translator? It's definitely not a marketing role. For me, it's, it's more like an engineer who has an ethical foundation in his human behavior. Understanding that profit is the easy way out. I could choose for myself just to go for the profit and, you know, just not worry about the back end not following. However, I think there are many engineers that also think about the impact we have on global society. And basically, the AI translator comes more from them as we understand to a certain level the systems we are creating, but we also understand our role that we have in society. We make sure that we can collaborate, we find the right language, we find the right discussions and the humbleness to make sure that those that we need to help us creating systems that are going to be accepted and are going to have a place in our society are going to be integrated. So that's more the point. So it's not about marketing term or it's not about a fluffy term. It's really making sure that this translation of what it does, what it doesn't do, where we get it wrong, where there are potential risks, that these things get translated correctly. So it's a technical individual who perhaps serves as a moral compass? Yeah, a personal moral compass and gets more energy from this than from making profit. Right, right. And would this be someone that you would hire at your AI developing company to sort of oversee like AI czar kind of situation? Yeah, exactly. So since my book, there's actually a first course also called the AI translator here in Belgium, postgraduate course. Will they zoom in to a certain level of detail on the different topics that an AI translator should know? But you also see the first job description appearing, which is called the AI translator, which basically links in that context, the business and the engineers. Because that's where the disconnect is most of the time happening. Could you share a little bit about the course load for that individual? Yeah, absolutely. So what they basically get is they get at the start of the course, they get the AI canvas and they actually have to create one use case. But they don't have to just do it from a technical point of view and saying which data we need, which algorithm we're going to use. But they also get information about how do you look at liability? How do you look at fairness made by the decision of the use case that you have? How do you look at the GDPR of the data that you're going to be using? So all the things that are linked to the use case that they're proposing, they are going to be addressed through different evening sessions. I guess it's an evening course. They get people from the business talking to them. They get people from government talking to them. They get legal people talking to them. And so with the different pieces of information at the end of a year, they are able to create a use case that is very 
fundamentally prepared by design in order to land correctly in society when it has land. Or sometimes they even decide not to start with the use case. So in September, when they start doing the exercise, they think it's all fine. You know, this easy one. And so that's very interesting to see. It's definitely encouraging because when I have these conversations about building AI responsibly, the lingering question for me is whose job is it? And the answer is, oh, well, it's everyone's job, which usually practically means it's no one's job. And, you know, if if engineers Mm -hmm. are too busy working on developing the actual product, like, do they have time to really raise their hand and say, what are we actually building? What are the implications here? Some will, of course, but for it to be someone's actual role, that's an investment, right? That's more of like a line in the sand, like, hey, we're going to commit to building this in a meaningful way. So I just wanted to call that out. Yeah. And that's why the AI translator, it doesn't fit a typical role within a company at the moment, because you are working in silos. You either belong to the engineering department, you belong to the marketing, you belong to legal department. And a role like this is transferable. So it should almost rely on, on the direct line to the CEO of the company trying to implement the AI solution or trying to create an AI product, AI driven product. Because I absolutely embrace the technology, it might sound a bit negative here, but I absolutely embrace the value AI can bring to society if it's done correctly. So if you have done this role in your company, reporting to the CEO, understanding all the bridges that are needed to be built between the different departments, understanding the fact that if you're in one of these silos, you won't be able to build these bridges, then you do a fantastic good job. And it's not just a tick in a box from, I have an ethical committee, etc. No, that doesn't work. It's really somebody's actively building bridges and reporting to the top. And it's the top who finally decides we're going to go ahead or not. At the moment, what you will see is that the top doesn't understand. They have heard about it on a golf course, etc. We have to do AI. It passes through the engineers. Engineers create something. They don't think about the legal aspects. They don't think about the impact on ethical points. And then... It's only when the system gets operational and the brand gets damaged because of a certain incident that it gets to the level of CEO. And so what I say is that just turn it around. Just start at CEO level, put this AI translator next to him. And this person, the only thing does is making sure the bridges are built and that what we're creating is done in a fully transparent, ethical way. And I think that's the best way forward. That is a fantastic way to put it, Mika. And also, I don't think we're going to find a better bookend to this conversation than that. I really could keep going with you for hours, but we have books to write and podcasts to edit and all these other things. So Mika, at this point, I would just say thank you so much for being here with me. I've loved this discussion with you today. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. How AI Happens is brought to you by Sama. Sama provides accurate data for ambitious AI, specializing in image, video, and sensor data annotation and validation for machine learning algorithms in industries such as transportation, retail, e-commerce, media, medtech, robotics, and agriculture. For more information, head to Sama.com.